Well, hi, everybody. We're having some technical difficulty. Oh, here's Jeff. Jeff. All right. Don't be alarmed, Jeff. is I'm, just at his I'm other job. I'm going to assume that... <laughs> we're on. I think we're I'm on. I'm going to assume that we're live right now. All right. Hmm. How's that for, for punting? All right, Entree Architect Community is 4.10 p.m. Eastern, which means we're 10 minutes past time to start this conversation, which is called County Clarity Live. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, as you join us, uh, because we are simulcasting, because we're broadcasting and apparently breaking the internet, uh, we're live on the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. We are live on LinkedIn. We are live on YouTube. We are live with all of our fans and followers on Twitch. So wherever you are, wherever you're joining this conversation today, say hi, let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. Uh, it's always fun to see how far these conversations spread literally around the world. We often have uh, folks joining us from Anaheim all the way around to Australia. So how's that for spanning the globe? Uh, if, you, if we've never met, my name is Jeff, and I'm in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you are the employee of a firm or you own a firm. Maybe you've circled the date on the calendar and you've said, 2021's my year, and you've, you're on the runway to starting your own thing, or maybe you've had your own thing for a year or 10 years or 27 years, or Maybe you're happily in, embedded in the firm of your dreams. Whatever the situation is, we come here every weekday afternoon to cover one topic, to find clarity around one topic. And they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of architects just like you. So uh, great to see uh, Brian out there and Rod, uh, Erica, Jean, Liz Sloan. Hello to all of you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for saying hi. And anybody else, as you join us, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. Uh, some of you will notice that we see you on the, uh, on the right side of our screen and you pop up as Facebook user. Uh, as a, for instance, James Polk. <laughs> I happen to notice James because he's the only architect I know in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. But James pops up, he shows up as Facebook user. If you would like, because Facebook, uh, because of Facebook privacy policies, uh, they cannot let your information out of the private Facebook group unless you give it permission. And the way that you can do that, if you want to, if you want us to be able to identify you like Rod Warner, I see Rod, he's on Facebook, but I see his name. The way that his name got there was he went to chat.restream.io slash FB for Facebook. Uh, that's the link that Catherine posted in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. If you'd like your name to show up, only in Facebook, um, you can click on that link and start that process. So thank you all for joining us. Sorry for the technical difficulties and the late start here. We've got a very important conversation to have here. We've got a very special guest uh, with us today. All week, we have been focusing on Jedi topics, and that doesn't mean Star Wars. Uh, if it meant Star Wars, you would have to have somebody else because I don't know much about Star Wars. Sorry to say that. Sorry to disappoint a lot of you, but uh, Jedi is not Jedi for us this week is not Star Wars. It's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we started out this week with the asking the question: What is Jedi, and how does what does it what does it mean for the profession of architecture? What do we need to consider in the profession of architecture when it comes to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion? Then on Tuesday, we talked about JEDI uh, as it relates to hiring in the profession. Yesterday, Wednesday, we talked about JEDI as it relates to working in the profession. Because it's one thing to think about the future of your firm, to hire, for, hire employees for the future of your firm, or to look for a job, uh, to be a candidate in the profession of architecture. And it's a totally different thing to actually have a workplace and to work in a firm and to build a career in the profession of architecture. So that's why we made the distinction on Tuesday and Wednesday. And today uh, we're going to, I'm going to introduce our special guest here in just a minute. And we're going to go from sort of a general view of JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the profession of architecture and look for real application, real application in terms of your work 
as an architect. So uh, that's where we've been. That's where we're going. Catherine, what did I forget? I think you covered it all. Maybe, um, what else is there to say? Maybe a little bit about where you are. Just people might be curious. <laughs> yes, for those of you who are curious and, and don't recognize me at all, uh, I am not in my basement. I am in the press box at uh, Warrior Stadium, Warren Central High School in Indianapolis, because uh, I have to do the public address announcing for uh, I guess this is the last conference baseball game of the season. It's a conference rivalry. We're playing the number one team in the state. And basically, I don't have enough time to get from my basement to here before the national anthem plays. So, <laughs> so I had to make the decision to jump here and uh, try to run this from, from my other basement in the sky. So thanks. Thank you for that. Thanks for hanging in on the uh, technical difficulties. Hopefully, the connection rides all the way through this with us. So uh, with that, without further ado, because I know we burned a lot of time and our, and our guest is very special and uh, they have a hard stop. So let me just go ahead and tell you that uh, our guest today is an advocate and an architect of the Apple stores. She's a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. She's a founder, the founder of Equity by Design, a thought leader in According to Metropolis Magazine, which I think this is super cool, according to Metropolis Magazine, she's a game changer. Rosa Shang, welcome to Context Clarity Live. Hi, everyone. So great to be with you all this afternoon. <laughs> well, as we well, have, I, are you there, Jeff? Okay. I'm, I'm glad that you're. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm glad that you're here with us, Rosa, and I'm I'm ha I'm really happy that both of you are in a much much more presentable, much nicer, probably much cooler space than I am in today. So, um, so welcome to you. And um, wh one thing I want to say is thank you for inspiring this topic covering all week. Um, I know that for some people, I know there are plenty of people probably that land on these posts, right? Where we announce, hey, we're gonna be talking about Jedi today. We're gonna to be talking about uh, equity and design when it comes to hiring and all, all those things that, that we just talked about, we've been talking about all week. And some people land here and go, yeah, that's not a topic for me. Uh, and you know, my, my response to folks out there, if you've landed here and, and, and don't know what you've just gotten yourself into, yes, we are gonna be talking about justice, equity, uh, diversity, inclusion, and if you think, oh, that's not for me, I um, I respectfully disagree, right? Because I, I think this is a topic, uh, these conversations are conversations not only for all of us, but they're conversations that we all need to be a part of. And so, uh, Rose, I appreciate you coming here to help us, maybe help guide us through this conversation, um, this conversation today, especially uh, in, in the way that we can take idea principles and then apply them to the design process, which I think is kind of exciting as a topic today. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's about growth ultimately. And um, you may have heard the term comfort zone, right? So getting comfortable with the uncomfortable conversation and challenging ourselves um, to grow not only personally, but professionally, because ultimately these issues that we're dealing with that we saw in 2020 aren't going away. And how our relevance as design professionals uh, in the built environment can either serve or not serve the communities that we're in uh, determines our future well-being as a profession. So this is a conversation for all of us. And a shout out to uh, all of the and, people and that you... took <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, you've got you've got a lot of uh, a lot of people, a lot of fans in the audience. You've got a lot of people that that really appreciate. Um, you know, you've been breaking a lot of ground. You've been both with the studies with Equity by Design. You know, going all the way back to the missing thirty two percent. You you have uh, you have you have your own following, uh, which I think is fantastic, and, and I think the reason have that following is even better because uh, because you are um, you really are spurring these really important conversations 
Um, and, and looking forward to getting into this exploration today. I think it's fascinating to think yeah. about, um, you know, we're the, the, the built environment, the places that we work, the places that we go, the places that we shop, whatever the case may be, architects design some portion of those things. Architects control some portion of the decision-making process. But there's a lot, I mean, everybody knows this, right? There's, there's a lot going on in terms, there's a lot of complexity. Um, there are a lot of things to consider. And I think it gets even bigger in a way when we think about who really should be at the table when it comes to, well, I know who wasn't at the table when this press box was designed, but who, who needs to be at the table when we're talking about these things? Ultimately, everybody needs to be at the table, right? Um, we trained through our design architecture training to be facilitators of that conversation to provide the language for which uh, the people that use the, the ultimately the buildings and the designs that we do. But the interesting thing is only 2% of the population influences our commissions, like who hires us? That's only 2% of the population, whereas 100% of the population is affected by the built environment, where we live, where we sleep, you know, where we call home, where we go to work. And then the third place, like the place that creates our, our cultural network, you know, our, our vital uh, support, you know, if you will, our, our families, our friends, you know, our, our communities, right? So a lot is at stake with uh, the attention to architecture around us and, and who benefits from those environments and who is left behind. And that's been more prevalent this past year than anything else, I believe, with the pandemic and the sheltering in place. Uh, you know, I think, I think that's a, I think that's a really great point as well. And, and, and you know, one of the things that comes up a lot, whether we're talking about justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, or just, you know, how people live in their homes, you know, or, or shop for groceries anymore, uh, it, it strikes me that with, with everything that has happened, everything that has changed, everything that continues to evolve, um, I, I wonder how many people are thinking more, probably didn't intend to, probably didn't expect to think more about some of these topics. But one of the things I brought up yesterday as we were having this discussion about working was that I hope this is, you know, I, I, I may lose some clients here. I may, I may lose some, some folks, but I really hope that there are leaders in some firms, especially those firms that have this attitude that, you know, everybody needs to have their butt in the seat, right? In the office. I hope there are a lot of those leaders that have been working from home for the last 15 months with their kids all around them and having to homeschool, uh, you know, quote unquote, homeschool, help their kids with school. Um, so that they, you know, the reason I say that is I hope that they um, have had the opportunity to experience the difficulty and the balancing act and the juggling. Uh, and I know that's only, I know that's only a small, a very small part of what we're talking about, but I think exposing um, exposing ourselves, exposing each other uh, to the challenges that others face, I think is important. Yes. So I want to start off by debunking some myths or what might people might think when they hear the word Jedi or anything related to, you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion, right? Those words, justice as well. And um, essentially what we're trying to create in talking about these issues, what I call the Jedi agenda, is um, transitioning from this idea that Jedi is only about, you know, unfairness and uh, the people that have been historically disenfranchised, which it is an important part of um, that, uh, what we're trying to do in terms of writing the ship. But it's also about the future and where we're going and our survival as a civilization. Um, it, it, it transcribes the boundaries of it just being about social issues to really reaching into environmental justice um, and also health equity and health outcome issues. 
And as we've seen in 2020, all those things, the social, the environmental, the health impacts have affected us all, right? And, and disproportionately, it has affected uh, the people of color, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, et cetera, that have been undermined by policies and practices that have been put in place that have been daylighting themselves in terms of access to healthy environments um, po- versus polluted air that we breathe, the water. Uh, shout out uh, to Kurt and Flint, uh, you know, the dirty water, right? And these things are aggregate over time of the policies and practices that the people have come before us have put in place. But even though we could say somebody else did that, I had no control over it. I, you know, disavow myself of any connection to that. Yet there's still the problem. We still have to fix the problems that those remnant policies, procedures, and practices have created in our society. Yeah, thank, thank you for that clarification. And, and um, you, you know, I think that's just further illustration of, of maybe how, uh, how broad this conversation can and probably probably should be. Um, one of the things, uh, Isra says, first time starstruck in my life. <laughs> I so like my comments. Excellent. <laughs> that's, that's what this is all about. That's what bringing Rosa uh, on to Context Included is all about, is, is getting everyone to be starstruck. I love that. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, one of the things that we have been talking about, and, and obviously I mentioned at the beginning, we're, gonna, we're transitioning from what is Jedi to hiring and to working. And now uh, the idea today is um, what, how do we, what does a just and equity centered design process look? So what I would love to have is Rosa, not only for you to speak to that, um, and, and, and I know I see that on my, my connection, my audio is going in and out. So I'm going to try to talk as little as possible. Um, sure. but I would like to have Rosa, if you would speak to, uh, some ideas, and I would really love to have our audience, um, you know, everybody that's live on on Facebook and LinkedIn and, and YouTube and Twitch, I want I want everyone to weigh in, right? What do you think? What do you think needs to be considered? Uh, so follow Rose's lead. Let's just brainstorm this. Let's think about the question, what does a justice and equity center design process look like? How do we apply that? Let's see where we can go with that, that question and that conversation today. It might feel difficult for those that you know don't have um, a history or foundation in, in learning about justice and equity, but we can all start off simple. Um, how many of you have heard of the design thinking movement and have gone through a design thinking exercise? There are certain rules of the road in that process, um, primarily that no idea is a bad idea in the starting of the brainstorming part. And this premise of yes, and you may have heard that from an association with acting improv, where you're supposed to support the part, your partner, right? It's never, no, that can't be done, or no, that doesn't exist, or that's not possible. But okay, I hear what you said, and let's add to that. So let's use that framework as a way that you guys are adding on to the conversation, right? So like, versus being feeling threatened or, or wanting to debunk something, Let's just start of a place of openness of that uncomfortable conversation and letting that kind of be the what we're calling holding space for this conversation to happen. Right. Let's be open minded and not try to be defensive and not to try to say, well, that's not me. I don't do that. I'm not a racist or I'm not this or I'm not that. Mm. But let's just let it flow. Right. Let's let's confront this together because. The first step of, I read the book, I don't know how many of you may have read it, How to Be an Anti-Racist, I like in the middle of the book, but it is a very uh, difficult subject matter to digest. Yeah, and it's the a great, great thing, book though. Yeah, yeah. You have to ask yourself is, am I a racist, right? And the, the reaction, the immediate gut reaction is to say, I'm not a racist. I, I couldn't possibly be, I do all these things that, you know, are good for the world. Um, but if we look at the definition that Dr. Ibram X. Kendi puts out there, 
of there's the personal belief systems, but then there is the ra- the racial constructs of institutions and of society and organizations. So when beliefs become indoctrinated into practices and policies, like our laws and in, in our country, that's when it affects us all, regardless of whether or not we believe in it or not. It's just baked into our systems. So what happens when there's 200 plus years of baking in a racist ideology into the policies and practices of our country? A great example is redlining, the segregation of our zoning practices. Even though that officially went away, guess what? The the damage of that redlining, the the legacy of that segregation is still with us. It's still deeply ingrained into the fabric of the places where we live. Who gets access to resources? Who gets to live in what we call sacrificial zones, the disposable places where we dump, you know, toxic chemicals or our air is polluted, right? Uh, who's more susceptible to disasters or forest fires? Who's most vulnerable? That's all baked in from those racist practices. Even though we weren't even born at the time that some of those things were, you know, come up with. Um, if we are complicit and we say, somebody else did that, I didn't do that, I wipe my hands clean of that, um, we're perpetuating the situation. We're not making it better, we're, we're actually making it worse. So the deep thought of the day is to, to accept that if we, it's a daily practice, it's not you're forever a racist, but each day is new. You have to decide, today am I going to do things that disrupt or dismantle racism, or am I going to, you know, coast today and not do anything? And so one day I could be racist because I'm complicit. The next day I could be anti-racist because that's my intentionality. The goal of mine is to be mostly anti-racist. Can I be 100% anti-racist? Probably not because I still have blind spots and I'm constantly learning. And so that's something that I challenge all of you to look at, look in and around yourselves not just your own belief systems, but what's unconscious and then what's also baked into our systems in policies and practices in our, in our workplace in your small firm, you know, single person firm or small firm in your local governance, um, you know, with ordinances that are written about, you know, loitering, even like who's perceived as loitering. Uh, Mainly that's to police, you know, who's, who's suspect in terms of being legitimate and being outside in public space during certain hours of the day. If we look at Europe, everybody's hanging out, right, and socializing. But here, if you're hanging out and you have a certain look to you, you're suspicious, Yeah. right? And that's baked into our psyche over time. So I'll leave that there as a starting deep thought. And I'm looking at the comments coming. (laughs) Well, yeah, Jay says that as a he's a white cisgender straight male and his goal is to listen and learn. And I feel similarly, I'm also not male, but I am white cisgender straight woman. And so I've been learning. And one thing I got from that book that you mentioned um, being anti-racist is that he says even he's racist in their me- racist meaning, thinking one race is better than the other, which is, I think, we don't even really see it just because it's so just the way things are white is normal and whatever else is something else, you know? So if, if you look at it that way and not in a value judgment as in racist is I can't be racist because I'm a good person. I think that's where a lot of us get kind of stuck in what even being willing to look at race. But again, but I'm just saying that as a pretty privileged white person. No, that's important. I I value that perspective. And I think somebody asked a really great question. uh, What lessons can I share about um, helping to shift one's viewpoint, right? And so in my personal journey, it was challenging myself to ask myself, how many close friends do I have at that por- point in time that are Black, that are Indigenous, that are Latinx, outside of my context of the people that I have befriended in my life? And I had to be honest with myself. At, at that point, I when I started questioning these things, I didn't have that many people who I could say I was really close to of certain you know racial categories. So the challenge to all of us, I think, as this kind of long-term understanding and empathy building is not only to befriend people of different races, but I extend that to intersectional identities, meaning 
people who are neurodiverse, you know, that have mental wellness challenges, people with physical disabilities, people who might be undocumented. Um, anything that you feel uncomfortable with or have certain perceptions of, if you don't know anybody personally who's grappling with uh, being from that particular identity, try to find people, at, you know, you don't have to become best friends with them right away because then that's disingenuous. And it's kind of like just saying, I check the box, I have black friends or I have Asian friends or something like that. But really authentically, get to know your community, get to know the people around you. And then when you have, when you feel like you have a co-trusted relationship, um, dare to ask those, you know, perspective questions from them, right? And ask them about their lived experience and what it's like to be them, you know, and, and that's where we start to grow and I think overcome some of these core challenges of fear of, you know, it, I think even with, um, you know, the people of color, there's this kind of caste system, right? And you've heard of, maybe heard of the model uh, myth minority that Asian Americans face. And so I've been grappling with that a lot in terms of, I believe in Black Lives Matters. I believe that is a very important part of what we need to do in our country is to raise the awareness of anti-Blackness in our country, the history of it and grappling with it. But then at the same time, I felt like, oh, I have to minimize and not talk about my Asian identity and, and kind of hide that and, you know, put that on the side. But then there was the anti-Asian, there was the, uh, the violence that happened this year because of COVID. And that made me realize, no, I have to not only speak up for other races that are facing oppression, I have to speak up for my own. So it's not what we call oppression Olympics, where <laughs> if, if we address what somebody else is facing, that we're minimizing so another group's trauma. If anything, that co-acknowledgement, I think, is powerful. And it's that acknowledgement that we're in it together and we're supporting each other. And the thing that we actually have to combat is um, racism and white supremacy. And it's not against white people. It's against an ideology that undermines our society at large. Right. And I think it's really, that's a really important distinction because then people don't have to get personally offended at the idea of being a white supremacist, which isn't actually only in, in my mind anyway, isn't only the, the people carrying the torches in Virginia is actually just the way our society's kind of been constructed. And we need to acknowledge it before we can change that. So it's anyway, well, we've got a lot of long comments here, Jeff, what do you think we should do about that? <laughs> I'm going to love reading through them this evening. <laughs> um, so what we're, we're, we're looking at the question. So what does a Jedi design process look like? Ah, okay. okay. So that's been in the formulating processes, and I could share follow-up links to graphics that we've been using within Equity by Design in discovering, co-discovering the Jedi agenda together, what that looks like, because we don't have the answer. We're not going to fake it and purport to be an expert. Um, we launched a series of workshops in early, in mid-2020 when all these crises were piling on top of each other that we needed a new way to design. We needed to be able to co-address the issues we saw people were experiencing of um, being homeless, but also uh, at risk of being homeless in affordable housing, um, access to um, you know, uh, these job centers, but you know, having been displaced because they can't afford to live there. And then the mobility or the commuting that prevents them from being economically mobile and that was something that spoke deeply to a process that Brian Seeley Jr. of Colocate taught me in design justice advocacy, which starts from a place of um, being open and identifying those histories. So if you, if you guys in the chat could do this, if you can identify something that you see as an injustice or an inequity in the built environment, just fire, you know, off randomly, it could be very, something very obvious like uh, binary gender restrooms and how that doesn't address the transgender population, you know, as a very blatant example, but that's not the only example. Um, that's the injustice. Then we ask people, okay, what policies and practices 
have perpetuated that injustice. It could be actually our um, our governing codes about building, you know, and how those codes are written. They didn't exist before, but they were written about binary gender. Uh, the toilet and the urinal counts. That's something that's, you know, co-created by a group of people with a certain belief system of binary restrooms. Binary restrooms only existed, started existing um, in the early like 1930s. Before then, bathrooms are bathrooms. Hmm. And so that gives you kind of like this history of how policies and practices adopted as an overlay control how we think, right? And there, don't forget, there are segregated restrooms, right? During um, a certain period of our, you know, our, our country, which is really unfortunate. But those are rules and regulations that were written to our laws and our codes, mm. right? So we got rid of those bad things. Like if we see things that are undermining and creating injustice, we should be able to call that out and say, that's wrong. We shouldn't be doing it like that. Yeah. But is there a better way? Because what drives us to keep those things is fear. And a lot of what we're hearing right now is an example of, you know, identifying that injustice the uh, lack of access to restrooms, what we're doing in higher education right now is saying, can we design a better way to alleviate the fears and concerns that were created by these systems? And so the the problem of perceived safety was something that came up in a LinkedIn conversation when I posted this really well-designed all-gender restroom with zero sight lines. You can't see into the stall of, it's like going to a restroom where you have like almost individual rooms, but not everybody can afford to build these individual room bathrooms. So if you have zero sight line stalls, the walls go pretty much full height to floor to ceiling. You have a little gap for the sprinkler, but nobody can see you. Some, uh, a gentleman, um, brought up, there was this, uh, bias about women being and children being at risk in these bathrooms with men. And so I challenge that person to think about society and the culture that we've created where women can't feel safe anywhere, quite frankly. And I described an experience where I was literally at my FAIA investiture ceremony in a a house of worship in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. And the gentleman next to me who uh, a classmate of mine said, oh, say hi to this person. So I said hi to this person. There was inappropriate uh, sexual harassment, and I won't go into detail, but that made me really think and challenge how society has influenced our perception of safety in space. And I'm a mother, and I have two children, and my family was sitting 10 rows behind me. And if I can't feel safe in a place like that, what makes you think I'm going to feel safe in a bathroom, period, whether or not it's all gender or binary gender. Right. And I mean, I have so many things to say about the whole bathroom issue. For one thing, do people actually look like try to look in the stalls and bathrooms? Because I only go to women's room. So I, we don't do that in the women's room. I don't know what they do in the men's room. Okay, so we're going to say that first. It seems like is that really as much of an issue? I have a my oldest son is trans male. And, um, and so I feel his pain of not being able to choose the right bathroom you know he hasn't had top surgery yet so he doesn't look he look you know it's just like an unsafe space so for sure he never goes to the bathroom in public so but there's a code compliance question that i really want to answer if i can okay. and then maybe we could shift topics sure where um, is it i'll Christian find it you just keep talking. nielsen palacios yes we hear you uh, we do comply with codes. We designed an all gender multi stall restroom for a public institution, uh, a physical sciences building at CSU Chico. Yay to CSU Chico for thinking differently and challenging us. But we meet code. It is a functioning building and people are using the all gender restroom or if they don't feel comfortable, there is an alternating floor system where there's binary restrooms still available. So, one size, size does not fit all, but there is equity because there are choices mm. and people can co-respect each other's choices. I hope that helps. Was that the right comment that I brought up? Yes. Uh, okay. Somebody had mentioned something about, are you expecting architects not to follow codes? And 
Absolutely. No. We have to follow the codes, but we can also challenge them at the same time. We can get around them with design solutions, hmm. but we can also challenge them. Okay. So yeah, that was a great example of equity in design. So um, does anybody else have any ideas about um, what the Jedi design process looks like and how do we apply that besides zoning? I mean, I love that example of the bathrooms because it's that's the most obvious one right now but yeah. there's a lot of hidden ones that we're still discovering mm. um, in in the public sector in the public realm you see a lot of privatization of public space uh, I'm going to call it Hudson Yards right so private developer what was supposed to be a partnership with the city to create public space for New York ended up becoming captured or uh, I don't even know the, what the best word is um, basically hijacked by a development company. Uh, people might have differing opinions of that, but the fact that when you go visit this site, there are people telling you not to sit down and not to rest, but to keep walking. Mm. Like you're, you're going into the, um, they call it the shawarma, the thing that is like a, the stair to nowhere, the sculptural piece where you're, you're walking up the stairs and around it. And a friend of mine experienced, you know, after that very physical activity of walking up the stairs, gosh, you're tired. You really want to rest. You want to sit down at the plinth of this thing. Sitting down, they were told to not sit down as a group and to keep walking. That sitting was not allowed. Hmm. Can you imagine a public space where sitting is not allowed? Yeah, That's that what happens with the privatization of our public space. Hmm. And then who's deemed to be welcome in that space or perceived as being legitimate. We've heard a lot of stories of the Starbucks, uh, you know, all these cases where uh, black people are racially profiled and suspect, you know, and, and there was a, a black entrepreneur is trying to meet at Starbucks in Philadelphia and they were asked to leave, you know, and called out. Mm. And because they didn't buy a drink, but the irony is that they had been loyal customers of that store for years. And because that day they did not buy a drink, they were actually meeting a, you know, a potential business partner for a meeting there, which people do. I'm sure many of you have gone to Starbucks thinking it was like your public space. You can have a meeting there, but they were profiled. Right. And so yeah. this other thing is like who belongs and who doesn't is a constant issue with not only public space, but public institutions such as libraries, uh, places of you know higher learning, um, civic, any kind of civic centers, right? Yeah. Is it is it possible to address that through design? I believe so. Um, there's right now there's practices in urban design called SEPTED, which are related to policing and again this idea of monitoring and you know being the eyes of the street. Hmm. But first of all, I think, uh, and then practices of prevention, right? And in terms of like fencing and uh, putting up things that we perceive to enforce safety, but actually reinforce fear. Right? And we've seen yeah. that in the in public demonstrations in the last year, etc. Of, of perpetuating like, oh, the answer to Fear is more fear. You know, the answer to shootings in our schools is um, putting up, you know, the metal detectors and, and um, putting up, you know, barbed wire or, you know, gates, you know, more gates. Or, and yeah. that is really a shame because we're kind of undermining the systems of humanity and our civic network, our civ civic fabric of trusting each other. Hmm. That's another thing. The school shootings are, are maybe something we could do something with design to help that whole culture. It's just so I homeschooled my kids for many years, so they weren't involved in the active shooter drills or anything. But now now they are or now my youngest one is. And so suddenly, like being put into that without the lead up of doing it every year for your whole life, is kind of shocking. The idea that you're practicing not getting killed at school. You know, so how can we as architects help with that? I don't know. 
actually. Yes, Some, it's, uh, it's difficult. I think the citizen architect or the citizen not being the ideal word, but the community architect of being an active advocate in your communities is fundamental, right? Uh, knowing what's going on with your local city board, your city council, hmm. uh, board of education, even, you know, yeah. the policies and practices that are being put in place for the schools. Mm-hmm. Well, that's where we can that's make a big difference locally. Yeah. yeah. Um, so someone wanted you to spell subted. Subted. Thank you. C-P-T-E-D. Thank you. Urban Collaborative Architecture. I believe that's Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> There's, there's one question, I know, and I know we're getting close to your your hard stop. Um, we're not that many minutes away from it. And again, apologies to everybody for uh, the technology issues today. But um, one of the things I realized this morning on uh, Clubhouse, and for those of you who are listening in who have never joined us uh, for, for one of these conversations, we have contacts and clarity. It's 4 p.m. every weekday um, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern every weekday inside the Entre Architect Community Facebook group. And then, of course, like today, it's 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 streamed out to LinkedIn and, and YouTube and Twitch. But we also, we, we kind of prime the conversation. We start the conversation in the morning at 9 a.m. Eastern on Clubhouse. And that's, that's why I, I mentioned Clubhouse. Uh, and this morning, you know, as, as we're talking about the same topic, we use the same topic at 9 and 4. Um, one of the things that popped up was, or, or that cropped up in the conversation was this idea of, yeah, there, there's architects and, you know, everybody that's involved, but also clients, right? Users uh, and clients who may not even be users. So um, I think Leslie's comment here is, is, a, um, is a good one that there, there's probably some work to do in convincing clients at times to care about to participate in, et cetera. Is there, do you have any, any suggestions for, for that kind of, uh, for that dynamic? Convincing clients? Yes. Um, it's a value proposition, right? So um, it's not just to be altruistic. That's not enough, right? That we're do-gooders. There is a financial value proposition to be had um, not only for architecture firms, but for those that we design and build things for. And that is that um, the reality is that the population is becoming more diverse. We know from the census predictions that by 2045, the population will be, as you had uh, categorized it, the majority minority, which is that the collective demographics of people of color will uh, steadily overcome the the majority Caucasian population. And I think that information is frightening for people that identify as uh, being white, because I think there is this idea that you're giving up something or that not being in the position of power anymore is a fearful position. But the inverse is true in that um, the people who haven't been in power collectively, they still, they while they may be the majority, they're still on a daily basis undermined individually in our society, right? So there's empathy building there instead of thinking of it only from one's own self perspective. But in terms of our clients, um, especially in places such as healthcare and higher ed, there's, there's business to be lost um, for the population going to schools. There's less uh, of a population growth. Therefore, there's a slowing down of the people going into higher education. There's less students. It's more competitive. So schools are at a crisis because they're losing out. If they can't attract the more diverse population in both mindset and provision of resources, they're going to pick another school. That's what we've been telling our clients. And you have aging infrastructure. It costs a lot of money to upgrade that aging infrastructure. In order to upgrade it, you need money to do so. You need students. So for the students that historically have been ignored, they're finally at a place where there is a position of leverage. It's not power because there's still these historic systems of injustice, 
but it is a point of leverage in this conversation. And that goes for healthcare as well, in terms of the communities that we serve. You know, it, it does affect the bottom line, I think, as we transition to a more values driven society. Right? Who do we hire? Who do we do business with? People want to know what are your values? They're going to want to know when they hire you, um, architect, uh, whether or not you believe in sustainability, whether or not you believe in just and equitable practices, right? And you could be left behind. Maybe not now, but maybe in the future, right? So there is a value proposition to really understand these things and to become leaders. Yeah, definitely. Do you want to talk a little bit about this podcast episode that you'd recommended? Oh, yes. Um, so a, a book, another book recommendation is called The Sum of Us. And it talks about examining the hidden cost of racism for everyone. And so this has been um, the common theme of our discussion today is not just how it's, oh, it's fairness for those people over there. But it's actually fairness for us all. And it's justice for us all in, in making sure that the future that we live in is the best that it can be for humankind, right? Improving the human condition. And this podcast on NPR is a great soft uh, lead into it because you can hear the interview with the author and you can read a quick, it's a short read. It's not a big commitment. And if you decide that you're interested, you can get the book. I don't have any affiliation with the book at all. But after, um, you know, listening to the podcast and I started reading it, I, I feel like it makes great sense of how we can continue the conversation and work together towards this more ideal future together. Yeah, well, that's I mean, the first the first move would be to understand, maybe see the issues from someone else's point of view, because we just maybe a lot of us don't see these things. And so when someone points it out, then. I, that helps. So anyway, I'm going to read that book. That, that's a that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that, Rosa. And and that's what I hope that you know we're, we're this is what this is Thursday, so we're four days into this week of conversations. That, you know, this is just our small. It's it's one hour a day. It's half an hour on Clubhouse. Uh, and again, I, I keep saying this every day. I know that half an hour on Clubhouse in the morning does not do any of these any of these topics justice, right? It's, it's, uh, it's not enough in an hour in the afternoon, but this is, this is the platform that we have, right? This, this hour that we have together this afternoon is the platform that we have. And I hope that in some small way, having these conversations today, um, every day this week can help, uh, expose. And I don't, and I don't, I want to be clear. I don't mean expose, uh, in a negative way, uh, but expose others' realities, expose others' experiences, um, expose others' challenges to us. Because again, and I'll, I'll say it again, I haven't, I haven't said it yet in this hour today, but but yeah, I, I am the middle-aged white guy in the room, right? And I've got a lot to learn. The only way that I can learn is to listen and, and, to, and to read through comments uh, that are uh, on the screen today and... and um, and hopefully I can help uh, alongside Catherine and, and Rosa by facilitating and hosting some of these conversations. Um, I, th I think it's a, uh, I think it's the place that we can start. I think yeah. there are lots of places. And I want to just stress that I'm not the expert either. I am a curious provocateur of wanting to do better. Right. And so we can all be curious provocateurs in our own circles where we live and challenging ourselves. And I think the beauty of the conversations that I've seen is that there are people who think a certain way and you think that they're never going to change their minds. Um, but when you actually continue the conversation and you, and you do see change, that's really inspiring. People that I never thought would uh, see another point of view or not be riled, you know, into fear right away and defensive are coming around and it's important and that's heartening and motivating to keep going in these yeah. difficult times. Yeah, great. That's, uh, that's an excellent point. I, I 
Rosa, I appreciate you uh, joining us here. And I, I want to make sure that we can we sign off here momentarily because I know uh, you need to have a little bit of, of uh, buffer to, uh, uh, to get to your next thing. So uh, I appreciate you. And I appreciate you taking the time uh, to st- the time to spend and, and for tolerating our issues today. <laughs> but uh, but thank you for, for thank you for being that provocateur uh, in everything that you do. Thank you. That went by way too fast. We, we can see do this again here. sometime. I Maybe hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we probably need to actually. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We need to. Um, and I'll retreat back to my basement and we'll, <laughs> and we'll, and we'll do it again sometime. So Rosa, thank you very, very much. Good. It was a pleasure. Thanks everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and to everybody that's out there, uh, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching or, or listening via the, uh, the podcast version of this, you can find out more about equity by design by going to EQX design.com. Uh, that's where you find the website for equity Des- by design. There's lots and lots of resources there. There's a blog. There's all kinds of things that you can consume there and subscribe to there. I'd encourage you to learn more. Uh, check out uh, everything that Rosa has talked about, the podcast, um, and, um, and and read through, read through these comments tonight. Respond to some of these comments. Answer some of these questions. Ask your own questions. That's that's the beauty of these platforms. And one of the things that we always explore, we like to explore with what we're doing here with Context and Clarity Live is how we leverage these platforms to our greatest advantage. So if you're watching on Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube or Twitch, when you respond to a comment, it bumps this conversation back to the top. That's how the algorithms work. And so one of the best things that you can do is comment, continue these conversations, because even though the recording, even though the live piece stops here momentarily, um, the conversations live on. So uh, please, everybody, everybody do that. Uh, it, it really, I think it will really help to keep these conversations top of mind and, and top of top of uh, feed or whatever, however we say it. So uh, with that, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Rosa. And um We'll see you again tomorrow. I'll be back. Same bat time, same bat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. And we'll be asking the question, what did you learn this week and what are you going to do with it? Uh, I'll also be on Clubhouse tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock a.m. asking the same question, coincidentally. What have you learned this week? What impact has it made in your life, uh, in whatever it is that you do? And what are you going to do with that? So, um, again, thanks, everybody. Appreciate all of you. And we'll see you again somewhere sometime soon.